It was in Naperville where I went to school, where I made friends, joined Girl Scouts, all those formative experiences that are part of the American fabric. It was also in Naperville where I took a swimming lesson when I was eight and noticed something was wrong with my heart. I was soon diagnosed with a condition that can prevent the heart from maintaining a normal rhythm. After my diagnosis, I was surrounded by a team of doctors and of nurses who cared for me. And from those treatments, I saw how a career in healthcare could allow me to make a difference for people in the most personal of ways. So I became a registered nurse and later went on to serve in the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, where I worked on everything from implementation of the Affordable Care Act to disaster response as a senior advisor under President Obama. Through all these experiences, I saw how fundamental health care is for American families. If you're sick or your child is, nothing else matters. I know this personally. The heart condition that I was diagnosed with as a child is called supraventricular tachycardia. But in the context of our healthcare debates today, it's known as a pre-existing condition. And after I left the Obama administration, I watched as the Republican health care repeal effort threatened to destroy protections that 130 million Americans like me with pre-existing conditions rely on. At the same time, health insurance premiums were rising and prescription drug costs were skyrocketing, and I knew I had to act. I ran for Congress in the 14th Congressional District of Illinois because the people in my community, the same community I grew up in, deserve better. And since I arrived, I've been committed to addressing the concerns of my constituents. To contain unaffordable premiums, I introduced the Health Care Affordability Act, which ensures that nobody who buys their own insurance will spend more than 8.5% of their income on premiums. I introduced a five-point plan to reduce the high price of prescription drugs because while we need to promote research and development, we can't do that at the expense of people being able to afford their treatment options. Constituents in my district also talk with me about cost barriers to care, even when they have insurance. That's why I introduced two pieces of legislation, the Primary and Behavioral Health Care Access Act and the Chronic Condition Copay Elimination Act, to eliminate out-of-pocket costs for primary care visits, mental health care visits, substance use disorder treatments, and common life-saving medications like insulin. And I'm proud to be an original co-sponsor of a bill to nullify a rule from the Trump administration that would promote junk insurance plans. We fought too hard to protect people with pre-existing conditions through the Affordable Care Act, and we refused to backtrack on our progress in covering necessary services like preventive care and mental health treatments. Amidst all this work on health care costs, quality, and access, I also decided to take on another issue that's deeply personal to me, black maternal health. When I was in graduate school at Johns Hopkins University, I had a friend named Shalon. Shalon was a lieutenant commander in the United States Public Health Service Commission Corps, a Centers for Disease Control and Prevention epidemiologist, and had a dual doctorate in sociology and gerontology. She was even more than her many professional accomplishments. Shalon was a talented chef, a skilled photographer, and an accomplished author. And she was so, so excited to become a mom. In early 2017, Shalon gave birth to a beautiful baby girl. Just a few weeks later, Shalon lost her life. I'd like to share with you Shalon's story as told by her mother, Wanda Irving. I hope you never have to read this letter. I cannot imagine you having to go through this yet again. And if you are, I am so truly sorry, Mommy. I hope you know how much I love you and how much you mean to me. I am sorry that I have left you. On the particular day that I am writing this, I have no idea how that may have occurred, but know that I would never choose to leave you. You will forever be my Mommy and I your baby girl. Shalon was my only daughter. She was loving, she was kind, she was generous. She was just always a curious child and loved to learn. She graduated from high school after skipping two grades. She went on to get her bachelor's at Hampton University. From there, she got a master's of science and then was accepted into a PhD program at Purdue University. 
She graduated with a dual PhD in both sociology and in gerontology, and she was the first student to do that at Purdue University. Both degrees were summa cum laude and all by the age of 25. She went on to public health because she had watched her brother who was battling MS, so she decided she'd go and get a master's of public health from Johns Hopkins, and then went on to become a well-respected epidemiologist at the Center for Disease Control. Unfortunately, her brother passed away, but she still devoted the work that she did at the CDC to her brother. Shalon was a very adventurous spirit and we had traveled to over 20 countries in the last five years. She just loved life. When Shalon found out that she was pregnant, she was just overjoyed. She had wanted to be a mother for so long. She went to every single OB appointment. She did everything her obstetrician required of her. She had had um, fibroids removed probably a year before the pregnancy. And then she found out at the time that she had Factor V Leiden. So she also had to take two painful shots every day to keep from clotting while she was carrying her baby. Well, based on her history, her medical team thought it was best that she have a planned C-section. She was prepared, she was ready, and she couldn't wait to meet the tiny human that she'd been sharing space with for 37 weeks. Shalon had tears in her eyes. She was so, so excited to see her daughter, and Shalon just held her. Within four or five days after getting home, she developed a lump on her side. She started having other symptoms as well, headaches, she wasn't voiding as she should have been. Her legs started to swell. She started to gain weight. She had headaches. And every time we'd go in to see a doctor, she was just dismissed with, you just had a baby, give it time. It'll get better. And she says, Mom, I, I don't feel right. There's something wrong. And I was just so concerned, but I, I didn't know what to do. During the last week of her life, Shalon went to the doctor three times for the same symptoms. On that last visit, she presented with blood pressure of 174 over 120. Well, let me give you some blood pressure medicine and you go home and come back in a couple of days if it hasn't gotten better. But don't worry, it should be fine. Just give it a little more time. Well, after we left the doctor's office, we went um, and picked up her prescription and we came home. And so we were sitting there um, talking a little bit more and all of a sudden um, she started to have this gargled sound that came out of her mouth and her, her arm shot up and she passed out. And I called 911. Probably five or six minutes later the ambulance was there. When I got to the hospital, um, the emergency doctor told me that she was in pretty bad shape. I found out a couple of days later that she was brain dead because of the lack of oxygen. My cousin brought in a medical directive that I didn't even know Shalon had. And it said, Mommy, I will fight hard, but if there is no hope, please let me go. And the next night, I happened to notice just one tear, it seemed like that came out of one eye. And I knew then what I had to do. We had her taken off life support at 9.14. She was gone. I lost my vibrant, beautiful, intelligent, best friend and daughter because she wasn't heard. I knew Shalon was a high-risk pregnancy because of her age, but I never for a moment thought that she was at risk of dying because she was a black woman. Shalon's story is devastating, and unfortunately, it's not unique. 
It's reflective of a crisis that cuts across education levels, income levels, geography, and insurance status. Moms are losing their lives at unacceptably high rates here in the United States, and families like Shalons are left to pick up the pieces. Some of you might know the statistics already. 700. 700 moms lose their lives every year in this country as a result of pregnancy-related complications, and the majority of those deaths are preventable. For every mom who dies, 70 nearly die. And the situation hasn't improved over the course of my lifetime. In fact, from 1990 to 2015, while maternal mortality rates dropped 44% around the world, they rose in the United States. The only other countries that can say the same are Sudan and Afghanistan. Part of the reason why rates are higher is because our data collection process has improved. For example, adding a pregnancy checkbox to death certificates in every state has allowed us to better track the cause of death for a pregnant or postpartum woman. The United States has also started to consider deaths that occur up to one year postpartum as a pregnancy-related death. Previously, we only considered the first six weeks after delivery, which fails to account for the prevalence of conditions like postpartum depression and anxiety that may worsen in the months after childbirth. Yet, however we collect the data, the takeaway is clear. We face a crisis, and for as dire as the situation is, it's even more acute for black women who are three to four times more likely to die from pregnancy-related complications as white women, and more than twice as likely than women of other races. And that's not a reflection of wealth or education. Even black women with college degrees are more likely to die than white women who dropped out of high school. In Illinois, black women are six times more likely to die as a result of a pregnancy-related condition as compared with white women. 72% of those deaths in our state are preventable, according to the Illinois Department of Public Health. This crisis demands action. And as a member of Congress, I knew that I could do something about it. So last April, just three months into my first term in Congress, I co-founded a caucus with Congresswoman Alma Adams of North Carolina to address this crisis. Now, because it's Congress, we had to give ourselves a name. So we called ourselves the Black Maternal Health Caucus, and we hoped that a few of our colleagues would join us and become members. But it turns out a lot of people were disturbed by this crisis. So far, more than 100 members have joined the Black Maternal Health Caucus, both Democrats and Republicans, all of us dedicated to elevating the Black Maternal Health Crisis within Congress and advancing policy solutions to reduce maternal mortality and end the racial disparities in maternal health outcomes. We've been busy these past 10 months since we've launched. And if you want to keep up with us, follow us on Twitter at BMH Caucus. And you can also head to our website. We will have some exciting news in the coming weeks when we introduce new legislation that we're calling the Black Maternal Health Caucus Momnibus. But before I tell you about that, I have to acknowledge that I'm talking to a crowd that's probably sat through a university lecture or a TED talk or two. And if your lectures were like mine, they usually had a structure, a three-point outline of what the professor was going to cover, and I want to do the same. Specifically, I want to answer the three questions that I'm most frequently asked when I talk about this crisis. One, why is it happening? Two, what are we going to do about it? And three, how can I help? So first, why is it happening? To answer that question, you have to start with the data. One of the most valuable sources of data in this area has been the development of the maternal mortality review committees. States are setting up these committees to systematically review and record every case of a woman who died during pregnancy, labor and delivery, or the postpartum period up to one year after delivery. These committees are tasked with rooting out the cause of each death and determining if it was preventable. In the last Congress, Representative Jamie Herrera Butler, a Republican member of the Black Maternal Health Caucus, introduced and passed the Preventing Maternal Deaths Act, which provided new funding and technical assistance from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention to states to, to support their maternal mortality review committees. In addition to the review committees, we know that it's absolutely critical that we pre prioritize listening to black women and their families. Our caucus has been committed to doing that work. Last summer, we hosted a stakeholder summit bringing in groups from across the country to tell us what they're seeing in their communities and how we can best address it. The coalition that our caucus has built is broad. We work regularly with black women-led organizations that are community-based, 
national groups like the Black Mamas Matter Alliance. We work with groups representing healthcare providers like the American Association of Colleges of Nursing, the American Nurses Association, and the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, as well as hospitals. We work with insurers and other private sector companies that address social determinants of health like Uber and Lyft. We know that if we're going to solve this crisis, we need an all-hands-on-deck approach. And there's still a significant amount of data that we need. We need to be able to focus on specific populations and ask what unique challenges they face. The Black Maternal Health Caucus Momnibus legislation will do this. Some of the bills will be part of our legislative package called for the first ever comprehensive studies of the scope of the maternal health crisis for specific populations like Native American women, women veterans, and incarcerated women. Our caucus is also working with the Trump administration to advance research on this issue. In December, we hosted the director of the National Institutes of Health, Dr. Francis Collins, for conversations with caucus members about NIH research on maternal mortality. One of the questions that caucus members asked Dr. Collins was simply trying to get at the bottom of what's happening. Why is the United States failing our moms? Dr. Collins said, although this is a multifaceted issue, the primary reason that he cites is health insurance coverage. And coverage truly is essential. If women can't access the care and services that they need throughout their pregnancy and the full year-long postpartum period, they face significant elevated risk for adverse maternal health outcomes. Another area where we have identified issues is workforce, where we're seeing both shortages of providers as well as a bias in the provision of care. And finally, we know that there are non-clinical factors that are driving outcomes, such as environmental conditions, access to housing and transportation, and nutrition. These issues lead us to the second question, how do we begin to solve the crisis? If we know that there's a problem with coverage, how do we fix it? And how do we ensure that maternal health care workforce has enough providers that moms can trust? How do we address these non-clinical factors, sometimes known as social determinants of health, that can have such an outside impact on childbirth outcomes? To start with coverage, we can begin with postpartum Medicaid coverage. We know that the African American maternal mortality rate is unacceptably high, yet we often overlook that the majority of pregnancy-related deaths happen after the day of delivery, and nearly a quarter of those deaths occur more than six weeks postpartum. Yet, the life-threatening risks that women face in the postpartum period in states that did not take up Medicaid expansion under the Affordable Care Act, Medicaid currently covers only women for two months after delivery. Given that Medicaid pays for nearly half of all births in the United States and more than half of the births to black women, we have a responsibility to do better. That's why maternal mortality review committees in states across the country have recommended providing the same, the full 365 days postpartum. In fact, the state of Illinois is currently in the process of applying for a federal waiver that would allow the state to expand Medicaid coverage to a full year postpartum. And I recently signed a letter to support that effort. Despite the urgency of extending postpartum Medicaid coverage, we've not made much progress in recent years. My trailblazing colleague from Chicago, Congresswoman Robin Kelly, took the lead by introducing the Mamas Act in multiple Congresses. Her bill would require state Medicaid programs to extend their postpartum coverage a full year. Unfortunately, no Republicans had signed onto the legislation. But back in November, we had a breakthrough. Congresswoman Kelly and I joined forces with Congresswoman Ayanna Presley and four Republicans to introduce the Helping Moms Act. This bill represents a compromise. Instead of requiring states to expand their Medicaid coverage to a full year postpartum, the Helping Moms Act makes it optional and provides states a financial incentive to do so. Official estimates suggest that take-up would be high, particularly in those states where this policy would be needed the most, like Florida, South Carolina, Texas, and Georgia. The Helping Moms Act shows what's possible when we reach across the aisle to address an issue that simply should not be partisan. And because of the deal we reached with our Republican colleagues, the Helping Moms Act passed out of the committee with unanimous bipartisan support. Thank you.
We hope to pass it and get it signed into law this year, which would be major, a historic step towards achieving a goal that congressional leaders and maternal health advocates have pursued for many years. In addition to expanding coverage, we also know that there are workforce solutions to the black maternal health crisis. First, we need to grow and diversify the maternity care workforce. In the United States today, more than five million women live in counties that have no hospital offering obstetric care and no OB providers. For example, I represent Kendall County here in Northern Illinois, a community without a hospital. And an additional 10 million women live in counties with limited access to maternity care. We need to grow this workforce, and we need to grow the workforce intentionally with an emphasis on making sure that moms are cared for by people that they trust. I'm grateful to representatives Lucille Roybal Allard and Jamie Herrera Butler, the bipartisan co chairs of the Maternity Care Caucus, for leading on the Midwives for Moms Act, which provides funding to train more midwives. To build on their legislation, the Black Maternal Health Caucus Momnibus will include funding to grow and diversify the perinatal workforce with both providers like nurse practitioners, as well as doulas, community health workers, home visitors, and other trusted community members who can help improve maternal health outcomes broadly and specifically provide support to black women who suffer at disproportionate rates. Within the maternity care workforce, we also need to have a specific focus on maternal mental health and substance use disorder. We are working on a bill with Congressman Joe Kennedy to make key investments in these areas and ensure that providers have the support that they need to treat women with symptoms of conditions like postpartum depression and anxiety. And finally, when we talk about maternity care providers, we need to have a conversation about bias. We typically call it implicit bias, but sometimes it's explicit, and sometimes it's just racism. And it's not just physicians. When a black woman goes into a hospital to give birth, she in in interacts with front desk employees, security staff, and other professionals. We have a bill to ensure that all of those employees are receiving training on an ongoing basis and it's all on bias and it means periodic training, not just a one-time webinar to check the box. The bill also provides funding to hospitals to establish offices that will give patients and their families institutionalized mechanisms to report cases of disrespect or evidence of racial bias because sometimes trainings aren't enough. And we need to start thinking about what we're going to do when a black woman is dismissed when she says that something is wrong. And finally, we need to think about non-clinical factors that are driving maternal health outcomes. According to the, Robin, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, social determinants of health like access to housing, transportation, and nutrition can drive as much as 80% of health outcomes. That means that even when you've developed the highest quality of obstetric care possible, trained the best doctors, built the nicest delivery rooms, it doesn't matter if a woman can't get to her primary care provider when she's pregnant because she doesn't have a car, or has to get time off of work and take three bus routes across town to see her provider. Doesn't matter if we give a woman the right drugs to keep her chronic condition in check if she's unable to keep the drugs refrigerated because she can't afford her electrical bills. That's why our Momnibus will specifically address social determinants of health, like safe housing, transportation access, healthy foods and nutrition counseling, lead testing and abatement, and childcare so that moms can drop their kids off when they need to attend an appointment and other social services. We are also providing grants to allow state and local public health departments, as well as community-based organizations to address the unique social determinant needs of their communities. If you haven't realized it yet, we've been busy, but we simply cannot do it alone. And that brings us to the last question, what can you do? First, you can stay up to date with the work of our caucus on Twitter and our website. On the website, you can sign up for updates so that you'll know when the Momnibus drops. <laughs> and when it is, I hope you'll join us to work to make sure that it passes both the House and the Senate. It's important work to do so that we can save moms' lives. Remember Shalon. Remember who she is and who she left behind. Remember Wanda, her mom, and Soleil, her baby girl, who's now three years old. Last fall, I sat down with Wanda and I asked her how Soleil is doing. 
And Ms. Wanda told me how curious Soleil is and how joyful and everything I'm sure that Shalon hoped that she would be. But she also told me that she walked into a room one day and found Soleil clutching a photo of her mother, asking where her mommy is. Soleil's question is my motivation, and I hope it will encourage you to join us to honor Shalant and all the women like her who we've lost. Let us take the serious and urgent action that's required to save our moms. Thank you. Wow. Lots to take in, and I have very few minutes to get these questions in. So um, last week, I asked Congressman Cha Sean, Cha Sean Kasdan if he could keep his answers short. OK. He couldn't. OK. So yeah. So I'm going to have to rush through. Okay. Oh, and Les, I want you to know, this doesn't count as our lunch. I'm just putting that out there, OK? All right. Um, so. Lots and lots of good questions for a very, very meaty presentation. Thank you so much. How many healthcare providers or people in the healthcare organizations do we have in the audience? Good number, good number. <clears throat> so I'm going to start with um, a question from Jim Terman from Jessica Terman. Jim, I know you're here. Sorry, there you are. Um, as a congresswoman from a swing district, um, does Bernie Sanders at the top of the ticket put you at a disadvantage compared to Bloomberg, Biden, et cetera, Klobuchar candidacy? Okay. Hi, Jim. Okay, so here's the deal. Here's the deal, Jim. Um, some people, so let's say it like this. Some people are neutral and some people are not helpful. <laughs> and no one, in my opinion, that's running on the Democratic ticket is helpful to me in my race. I guess that's controversial. <laughs> Sorry. President Preck, what was that stupid question? Oh yeah, no one talks about it. Can I follow up with that? So, so, so just for some context, just for some context, I won in November 2018 by five points. Our new governor, J.B. Pritzker, crushed it. He won statewide by 16 points. He lost the Illinois 14th by eight, and I won by five. Okay, we have had many people run statewide in our state and do very well across the state that do not win in the 14th district. Um, and so for that reason, I view the presidential candidates as neutral at best or uh, really difficult at worst. Thank you. Well. <laughs> If you know me, to find me stumped and speechless, that's... <laughs> so, <laughs> Ellie Foreman from Mesereau is here. I know she's here because she's sitting with me. Um, do you consider your label as a millennial to be a positive or a negative? And how do you leverage this label for the positive? Thank you. Uh, being a millennial is incredible. You know, for the first time, we have this real millennial caucus in the Congress. I'm 33. And I'm not the youngest. Now, the youngest black woman ever, but not the youngest in Congress. There's at least probably five or six of us that are my age or younger in the Democratic caucus. Uh, when you look at millennials being the cutoff around, I don't know, 37, 38 right now, we have at least 20 members. So now we can talk about these issues affecting our generation, everything from retirement security, economic security, tax and housing policy, health care, things that are impacting us our kids, the Gen Zers, everything from a bipartisan approach and uh, it's really relevant and timely. So I think it's an incredible superpower to have and I'm really proud to be able to lead in the Congress as a millennial. So uh, Professor Andrew Carr is not here. Is he here? I think I, I know him well. So he has sent in a pre-submitted question. You all can do that these days. Um, he is from Aurora University. And he says, from a public policy perspective, have the impeachment pro were the impeachment pro proceedings worth the taxpayer resources that were being utilized? Sometimes we have to make investments to do the right thing. 
and our democracy is always worth it. When you have to do the work of protecting and defending the Constitution, we have to get all the facts and make sure those facts are available to uh, American citizens, can carefully consider those facts, and then take action as appropriate, which is what we did throughout that impeachment process. This is another pre-submitted question. Josh Evans from the IARF. Do you know what that is? No, ma'am. Neither do I. The, <laughs> the See, we need a mark to tell. Thank you so much. I did not know what that was. He says the work for. Do you know Josh? Mark? Okay. Someone else knows him too. Okay. Uh, the workforce crisis. <laughs> Congressman says, "Hey, Josh." Hey, Josh. <laughs> the workforce crisis facing disability services in Illinois is now what is considered the new normal. In what ways can you and Congress help ensure that there are individuals that wish to become caregivers? We are facing tremendous workforce shortages across specialty areas. It's not unique to rehab. We look at psychiatry. We look at primary care provision in certain communities. We know that we are, in fact, at crisis levels. And it'll take more than just loan repayment services in order to successfully recruit and incentivize people to stay throughout our communities. Um, as you know, the 14th district is half rural and half suburban. In my remarks, I talked about Kendall County, a community that was, at one point in the last 10 years, the fastest growing community in the entire United States, the fastest growing community here in the state of Illinois, in a state where we have people who are leaving rapidly. This is a community that is growing, and its growth is being stifled because we don't have a hospital in that community, which means that there are tremendous uh, difficulties for certain individuals accessing the care that they need because we just don't have the workforce. We have to be doing this work in a systematic way, investing in our youth to recruit them and inspire them not just to go into STEM careers but to pick health care and to pick health care careers and stay in their communities to serve the population. We have an aging population in this country. Our health care needs are only going to expand. And right now, today, we don't have the workforce to do the work that we need, particularly in the communities where individuals live. Um, we have an Age in Place initiative. I know you all have it here in the city. We have them all across our communities and across the country. But in order for it to be successful, we have to have the workforce able to do that work which is why we're addressing it with the Momnibus for maternal mortality. But across the spectrum in healthcare, it's something that we're definitely keeping in mind. My efforts are not limited to loan repayment. Uh, it's about recruiting. It's about training and inspiring the pipeline at the very early stages when particularly girls, for example, are opting out of science careers in sixth and seventh grade. Right? We need to be working and, and having these conversations in middle school to get folks in that pipeline where they have, they'll have high enough grades to be able to go on to these careers um, in these high need fields. Creola Hampton from Greater Works. Are you here by chance? No? Okay. Uh, are you involved in getting equitable funding of black led organizations that provide HIV and AIDS services in Chicago and Illinois since the rates are getting higher among black men and women while funding remains highest for white communities? Okay. So I am aware that there is new funding available um, in the fiscal 20 appropriation for, I don't know what the exact phrase is, but it's something about like community driven HIV intervention type organizations. Um, and I would encourage the person who submitted this question to be in touch with my colleagues, Robin Kelly, Danny Davis, and Bobby Rush, um, who I think are best equipped to make sure that that funding information gets out to the communities that are uh, most impacted here in the city. There is a question here that um, asked, what do you expect to get done? I think she was pretty explicit with that while she was talking, so I'm going to pass that. And there are a couple of other electoral type questions, and I think she pretty much answered that, so I'm going to stay away from those. Um, there is a question from, very similar from Rebecca Levin. Are you here, Rebecca? Hi. Hi. And um, David Ginsburg from Community Health. And I'm going to touch on it and, and see how you will answer this. I'm very interested. If it were up to you, what solution would you propose to, res it's a two-part question, to propose to resolve the Israeli-Palestinian conflict? How would you try to persuade two sides to agree to your plan? And then Rebecca says, um, Betty McCollum, uh, she from, 
Minnesota mm -hmm. is sponsoring HR 2407 protesting the rights of Palestinian children. Are you aware of these issues and are you related to, are you interested in learning more about the bill? It's kind of a two part there. Okay. Well, so the very specific answer is that these issues do not come up in the Illinois 14th district. And I know that they are of interest here in the, in the city of Chicago, and I recognize that. And I also recognize, as a member of Congress, we have to deal with issues impacting the whole country. But I want you to understand the community that I represent, of which there is just not a sizable Jewish population, okay? We all touch and agree on that basic fact. Okay. Um, so this is what I'll say. The president put out his peace plan that Jared Kushner led. I think that that plan, while you know eagerly anticipated, uh, misses the goal, the goalpost of having a two-state solution. That plan, I think, is not going to really go anywhere. And. Um, you know, I think that we all want to have a pathway to enduring and everlasting peace. I do not have a plan. Um, and, you know, we are continuing to try to do and move forward efforts in the Congress that allow uh, people to maintain their core civil and human rights. How many people, you can certainly applaud for that. How many people in today's audience are living or working in the 14th? There's some more over here, okay. Um, Kevin Lawrence Dixler from the Kevin Dixler Law Office. Are you here, Kevin? Where are you? Hi, Kevin. How has the House of Representatives tried to reduce the four-year delay in adjudicating U visas for crime victim witnesses at, UC, at USCIS, which is inhibiting the criminal justice system and deterring corporations for the fear of deportation? Uh, I can't speak to that issue specifically. I'm not familiar with that type of a backlog. Um, but I do serve on the House Homeland Security Committee. I'm the vice chair in that committee. And I would invite you to speak with my staff, who's in the back. And we'd be happy to look into it for you. So the question that I want to ask you that I've been looking forward to asking you is, what do you think your biggest, and this comes from, I guess I should give the person credit since it wasn't my question, is Ruben Franco. Ruben, are you in the audience? Hi, Ruben. From the Australian Consulate General. What is your biggest challenge and what did you face this year as your biggest challenge in Congress? Oh, man. <laughs> Uh, okay, that is a good question. Challenges, uh, Congress is a crazy place. It has been totally wild. Um, I think that the biggest challenge is I assumed that when we would tackle um, issues that we would have the opportunity to consider the range of solutions. And that's not really how they present themselves to us. Uh, in my experience, a problem is presented with a solution that you have a binary choice on. Are you going to support that solution or no? Um, and there, because of just the way that the Congress has to function, we don't get to go deep on many issues. That's what makes this maternal health work so exciting for me, because we're able to go deep. On my committees, and I didn't even talk about this, I serve on three committees, education and labor, that's K-12, higher ed, labor unions, worker protections like paid leave, equal pay, um, and employer-sponsored health care coverage, which is how I got on that committee. Um, Homeland security, cybersecurity, counterterrorism, U.S. Uh, Mexico border type issues and then veterans affairs we can go deep there but on everything else it's just a binary choice for the most part am I going to vote for this bill yes or no um, and I think that the majority of the American people uh, when they examine our work when they examine our voting record and stance on issues they think that we have um, the opportunity to consider the range of solutions sort of like when we do appropriations right people are like well why did you only give 23 million dollars why couldn't it be 25 Right? Like the, when it comes to me for a decision point, it's in the context of, you know, billions of dollars of spending and we're not doing those individual line items. You all know this because you manage large budgets and you're familiar with the legislative process. But it was just, it's, it's um, challenging to navigate when, when the electorate's expectations um, don't match the reality of governing. 
Um, and so learning to navigate that space is one that has been a challenge, particularly when we are in a very partisan environment, uh, when we're in an environment where you're not uh, allowed to um, openly, I would say, uh, deliberate. <laughs> that is really being frowned upon. Um, people, don't, people don't trust when you say, I don't know, what do you think? Right? They think it's like a cop out um, and or you know, some kind of game that that elected official is playing. And so just learning to navigate that space um, when the range of options is not available to us is more difficult than I imagined it would be. You can apply for that too, for those of you who work. We happen to live in a state called Illinois, in a county called Cook, in a city called Chicago. We know a little bit about difficult yeah. politics. <laughs> so um, I really want to thank Congresswoman oh, Underwood. This has been her first time here at City Club, right? So you know, it's kind of like Groundhog Day. You get to keep doing this over and over oh, and really? over again. Yeah. So we'll have you back. Okay. We absolutely will have you back. When you have a room that's pretty much sold out, you get to come back again. Cool. So. Thanks for watching, and if you haven't already, please consider subscribing to our channel. And while you're at it, please leave us a comment. Thank you for watching.